Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone in the East, and good morning to everyone out in the West. My name is John Grugan. I'm a partner at Ballard Spar in the litigation group, and uh, I specifically focus my practice on SEC enforcement. Um, today is our first webinar of the Municipal Securities Regulation and Enforcement Group. We put it together some time ago uh, in order to combine the expertise of our public finance partners with the experience of our city's enforcement partners. And everyone else has noticed the increase in enforcement in this area, and we think that this um, was an appropriate and timely response to that. We had put on webinars several times this year. Uh, we also published a fair amount, including a year in review and enforcement and a mid-year enforcement review. And so if you would like copies of any of those documents or any of those alerts, just let us know, and we would be happy to send them to you immediately. By Brad Patterson. Brad is uh, co head of the Municipal Securities Regulation and Enforcement Group. He's a partner in our public finance group. He is resident out in Salt Lake City. Um, he is joined by Tesha Stanley, who's an associate in public finance, also resident in Salt Lake City. Tesha previously worked for the MSRB and also for the SEC. And uh, also, we have Jim Mitchell presenting today. Jim is a partner in New York City in our white collar and securities enforcement practice, um, and so uh, we're delighted to have all three of them uh, today. So, with that, uh, Jim, do you want to start us off? Sure. Thank you, John, uh, and thank you everybody for attending. Um, goal today is to sort of give you guys uh, a bit of an overview of what's going to come, and then to turn it over after a little bit to Tesha, who's going to walk you through some of the uh, events of 2013 and what they mean for what they mean for 2014. So, if you look at the first slide that is now on the screen, you see that uh, again we titled it "Takeaways from 2013," and basically the next, that slide and the following one will offer some of our views of what we think we've learned from the SEC enforcement actions that took place in the last year. Um, and without any further ado, the first says, and this. This is sort of guidance. Know what certificates you are signing. And here, obviously, this may seem obvious to people on the phone, but uh, the way the SEC builds its cases typically are off, usually and almost exclusively off statements uh, that they use either representation, misrepresentations or omissions. And those types of certificates supply the basis or premise for that, those actions. And I know we're here to talk about SEC enforcement actions, but just as an aside, as John alluded to, I do uh, white collar criminal defense work, and uh, just last year, I had a case that was brought by the Department of Justice and Trust Division uh, that involved uh, the municipal securities industry, and effectively a significant portion of the evidence in that case was represented by a current provider certificates uh, relating to compliance or, in the government's view, noncompliance with the uh, IRS safe harbor provisions of the uh, competitive bidding rules. So uh, these certificates are obviously important in, in all, all capacities. Uh, number two is elected officials should review disclosure or set up proper delegations of responsibility. Again, it's somewhat self evident but uh, officials, elected officials, can't know everything and you know every detail about about their municipalities or whatever their specific area of expertise or, or, or control is. But you need a reliable reporting structure, reporting in a diligent structure, and is going to be something that's important to, to, to keep you out of the circumstance where you're asked to certify or say something about an area that you just don't feel you're comfortable to do that. Uh, number three, underlying tax violations is likely, an underlying tax violation is likely to uh, a securities law violation. There, all I can say is, for um, example, you can be asked to make representations about the taxability of a certain transaction or non-taxability of a certain transaction. And um, if you are saying something that is incorrect, you could be subject to some enforcement action there. You know, and we'll add a little bit later the various theories of how those have been bought in 2013. Number four, activist behavior or bad behavior will be punished. And I, Tesha, will probably get to some of the specifics of this, but I know when I'll reference this case in Miami, uh, where part of the violations charged by the SEC included a prior cease and desist order that the city of Miami had entered into, uh, and as part of the allegations by the SEC, violated. Um, just as a sort of an aside, too, 
the city has limited resources, and where they choose to apply their resources is sometimes a guess, but one principle that I think we can all uh, speak fairly to is that if you have history or, or you're one of the, you're an entity that has a prior, they're going to focus attention on you and look for continuing problems. So uh, th that's something to be focused on. Number five, finding credits need to pay particular attention to good disclosure. Uh, this, I think, comes to continuing disclosure issues and uh, situations where uh, the circumstances of a municipality or an offering may change and the credit ratings may change, and you're going to need to be focused on uh, what is uh, what those changes are material and, and need to be disclosed on a continuing basis. Six and seven are, are relating to uh, pension fund disclosure as well as pension fund advisors, and here I just you know, you, you can do those specifically, but I did want to point out that we'll, we'll talk in about the SEC's new mark initiatives over the last couple of years, and there's a group specifically called the Municipal uh, Municipal Securities, but also on public pension funds. And it is a, an area of focus, obviously, for SEC that we see coming out of the 2013 cases. Uh, turning the page now to the second slide, third slide. Uh, Share of deals premised on some kind of valuation, and, and what we learned from taking from the case in 2013, not surprisingly, is that valuations or stated valuations can change, and the SEC can take a dim view if you don't update that information in a way that could be materially misleading an investor about some asset or some valuation of an asset that has previously taken place in a public disclosure. Number nine is just basically meant to indicate that all of these things uh, that we're talking about and we'll be talking about today, it's really important certainly to, to place uh, a process to train your municipal children, municipal employees about the risks concerning non-disclosure or, 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 or incomplete disclosures. Uh, number 10 is uh, alluding particularly to what one of the cases Tesha will re uh, talk about, which is the expert case, um, for example, where uh, what is sort of first case situation in the SEC is a case where the state of the city address itself was uh, put on a company's web, uh, municipality's website and became the basis for uh, a compliance enforcement program, enforcement action. Um, number 11 sort of speaks for itself, but obviously there is a trend in enforcement in 2013 that individuals are going to be uh, more focus uh, by the SEC. 12 and 13 themselves deal with underwriters, uh, and uh, just to include this section, that they do obviously have to be uh, very focused just on, on the initial, initial financing, but disclosures continuing after the, the financing has taken place and making sure that they are aware from the issuer if there are material items that change that might need to be part of providing continuing disclosure. Okay, so I'm going to the uh, page, which really the SEC is turning its focus to municipal securities. And a special unit, what, what I say on that is that back in January of 2010, uh, I believe it was Robert Kuzani, who was the Director of Enforcement, several new units of were created as priority areas for the SEC, one of them being, as I alluded to before, the Municipal Securities and Public Pensions Unit, which is a focus on things such as, um, I'm going to read from the SEC release, but offerings and disclosure for fraud, tax or arbitrage driven fraud, pay delay and public corruption violations, public pension accounting and disclosure violations, and valuation and pricing fraud. And those are sort of the, uh, not completely uh, but those are the things they chose to list in their press release when they announced the creation of this new unit. Uh, next bullet point, just sort of references that what you're going to see when you hear from uh, Tesha about the specific uh, cases that we've seen in 2013 are how they are breaking new ground and sort of bringing the type of uh, foreign actions that typically have not been seen historically. And, Finally, focus on secondary markets. Obviously, we're not just talking about the, the, the finance 
turning to the next. Why why is this focus? Or why do we see the SEC, in our view, uh, enhancing its market enforcement in the municipal area? Um, we're going to crack at listing some of the reasons that we believe. One, obviously, municipal financing itself is an expanding world, uh, and and just as a growing growing uh, area, one that garners more attention, including the SEC's attention. Clearly, financial crisis is a part of it. Heightened public sensitivity is there to all kinds of regulations and all kinds of markets, but I would say uh, particularly those that may not have been front and center before, and that's certainly in my view of the municipal, industry, municipal finance industry. Uh, from Congress, in passing Dodd-Frank, uh, which has offered up a few new things, such as uh, uh, some whistleblower provisions, uh, and also uh, particularly significant here in administrative proceedings, the SEC can now seek civil penalties in connection with what it views as securities law violations. Uh, again, the, the next bullet just refers back to the specialized unit that was created back in 2010. And they have a reference to regular web, which I'm going to try to describe uh, as best I can, but what I understand to be is by which regulators can now more easily uh, access broader information about things, related issues. For example, looking at or standing what periodic uh, continuing reporting obligations uh, an issuer may have and then comparing in very easy real time whether they're in fact meeting those reporting obligations in a way that probably wasn't as easy as it used to be. And a lot of this information was, was now put into, the, into a website on, and, and able to you know, order and access as it is. Okay, so the slide is uh, just talks, puts a, the text of the tab amendment up, which uh, not the text itself, but just short circuited. 1975, the Securities Exchange Act, uh, 34, prohibited, prohibits the SEC or the MSRB from requiring issues, issuers uh, to directly or indirectly file information uh, with those boards or the SEC prior to the initial sale of securities. Um, so, without getting into whether it should or shouldn't be amended, which of course is something that is, is a fairly timely topic, uh, what it leads to is really the next slide, uh, which is particularly where the SEC has chosen to focus its enforcement efforts in this area, uh, essentially making its own common law under the, the 10B, Rule 10B and Rule 17A of the 34 and 33 Acts. And I'm sure you've seen them before, but they're obviously there. And we'll also uh, appreciate from the, the case we're going to go through a little later in this presentation, they really uh, become the backbone of any of the just brought or ultimately the, the resolutions reached with municipalities. Um, okay, next slide. References some of the penalties uh, that now under Dodd-Frank are available for SEC administrative proceedings, and you'll see a cease and desist order uh, is now been supplemented as well with the product that might be facing a monetary fine, um, a civil penalty under the new newly enhanced powers of SEC under uh, an administrative proceeding. And I, I think we've got there, it's a, I think for an individual, if they're, the way they set this up, and it's not specifically spelled out in the slide, there are, I believe, three tiers of, um, of fines that scale up depending on whether it's just an unfined instance, whether it's something that involves deceit or fraud, and finally, whether it's something involving deceit or fraud that substantially injures another party. I think top fine, then, if you were tier three individual, is the $150,000 that we, we reference on the slide. So that has become a, a tool that didn't exist in starting to see the SEC move that direction, whereas before it was only cease and desist orders uh, brought, against, brought in these kinds of enforcement actions. Uh, turning to the slide nine, uh, now we flipping over to civil actions uh, that could be brought by the SEC in federal district court. Obviously, they maintain the ability to bring injunctions and also to seek uh, uh, monetary funds. And we've listed out here are, are the sort of not complete, but just list of the types of things that the SEC will look to or consider when they're A, deciding to look fine, and B, deciding 
how big it should be. Um, and for obviously one, one and probably this most significant has to be the level of the sort of scienter, the fraud, deceit uh, aspect to what they view the conduct, uh, who, if anybody was harmed, the extent of the harm, or unjust enrichment, what, what the municipality or, or other regulated entity got out of it. And coming back to a point we made before, if there's a violation of a prior cease and desist order or just some prior run-in with the SEC, uh, that can certainly be uh, a relevant consideration in, in what they're looking for or trying to get as a fine. Um, and then you have the concepts of general deterrence and other matters. But deterrence is something particularly in the municipality world I, I think the SEC probably takes it seriously because a lot of these cases they're starting to bring are getting a lot of press. Uh, witness this kind of presentation here and the and the very uh, significant attention we have, uh, it's attracting a lot of attention, and uh, that's certainly what they want to do to make people aware of these initiatives. Uh, and hopefully we can help you draw a little more about what they're actually focusing on. So with that, I'll turn it over to, I think, Tesha, who's going to spend some time uh, walking through some of the specific cases we saw in 2013. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as you can from the takeaways of 2013. 2013 was re really a year of SEC enforcement actions against uh, state and local governments and their individual officials. There are a couple of historical actions that really lay the groundwork for the actions we saw in 2013, and one of these is the uh, Orange County, California action. In the of Orange County, the SEC had issued a report under Section 21A of the Exchange Act emphasize that board members approving disclosure and offering documents are responsible for the contents of that disclosure. And uh, they provided an applicable example that if a board member has knowledge about the issuer's financial condition, then may affect its ability to repay bondholders, that he or she must ensure that the disclosure accurately reflects the issuer's ability to pay. Another one of these actions um, is the SEC act, SEC's action against the City of San Diego in November of 2006, and this is related to um, funding of a public pension plan. And in this case, this, the SEC actually named five former San Diego officials, and this really paved the way for the individual liability that we're, we're seeing today. Time, the SEC really emphasized that it views municipal officials as, as being in a gatekeeping role as they ultimately control the type of information that's provided to investors. Uh, so turning to some more recent examples, as Jim had mentioned, the SEC had formed this new unit in January of 2010, and as you can uh, uh, from its name, that one of its priorities is public pension accounting and disclosure. So in August of 2010, the SEC brought its first action in its history directly against the state, the state of New Jersey. And this is related to um, non-disclosure that two of its largest pension funds had, uh, pension funds were underfunded, and this math that the state would, was not able to make pension contributions without raising taxes or services. Fast forward to March of 2013, we had a second action directly against the state for similar uh, non-disclosure, but in this case, one interesting fact was that the state had disclosed that its pension obligations were funded pursuant to a statutory plan. What it didn't disclose is that the plan had a negative impact on its budget and financial condition. So again, I mean, the takeaway from these cases are you really need to make sure that your disclosure is thoroughly reviewed. On the side of this, the SEC has also been focusing on investment advisors to public pension funds. There are two notable actions in 2013. The first was a, an investment advisor that the SEC alleged had misrepresented its assets under management in order to meet minimum qualifications of the California Public Employees Retirement System. And it subsequently used its relationship um, to gain 
additional business and also misrepresented its assets under management in SEC filings. And the second action was just uh, alleging a misappropriation of funds. And again, the SEC is very focused on public pensions, not just on disclosure, but also on the investment advisors to these funds. Turning to the action against the city of Victorville in April of 2013, this is a, an example of the SEC taking action not only against the issuer, but specifically against one of the officials, in this case, the city's director of economic development. These involved tax increment bonds. They were used for redevelopment projects, including uh, uh, the um, of four new, new airport hangars. The SEC had alleged that some of the funds had been misappropriated and that proceeds were used to pay excessive fees and that these fees were not disclosed to investors. The SEC also alleged that uh, because the valuation, which Jim had mentioned earlier, can be problematic of these new hangers was overstated, that this resulted also in an overstatement of the tax increment that would be available to repay bondholders. And this case has not been settled as, as most of the other ones have, and it's currently pending in the Central District of California. And as Jim mentioned, we had some really important actions in 2013 regarding SEC actions related to secondary market disclosure. And one of these is the City of Harrisburg action brought in May of 2013. The city was a guarantor on debt for a resource recovery facility, and in the, in the State of the City Address, as well as in financial and budget reports, the city had failed to disclose its prior guarantee payments, um, as well as the likelihood that it would be making future guarantee payments. And what's interesting about this case is the SEC had said, you know, the lack of current information available to investors on EMMA, that these statements made outside of, of disclosure documents were misleading given the total mix of information. So we can infer that if, if the city had in fact had current and accurate continuing disclosure that these, these um, the addresses by, by the city as well as its fi financial budget reports would have been less weight given the total mix of information available to investors. Although no individuals were named in the City of Harrisburg action, at least one of the SEC commissioners had expressed sentiment that an individual should have been named, and it's really municipalities that they don't commit fraud, it's people that do. The next action we want to mention is against the City of South Miami in May of 2013. In this case, it involved a, uh, a parking facility and a retail project, and the city had failed to disclose the over-involvement involvement of the private developer in the deal, and this obviously would threaten the tax-exempt status of the bond. And this case has raised concern among issuers that voluntary disclosure of a tax violation can lead to further liability in terms of a security violation. And the SEC has attempted to alleviate these concerns, but the issue is still out there that there may be these concurrent tax and securities law violations, so issuers should be aware and just be careful when disclosing information. As you mentioned, the city of Miami, this is a, an example of um, some recidivist behavior that the SEC found to be problematic. This case really involves some interfund transfers um, in some instances of restricted funds. And the SEC alleged that these were used to mask deficits in the general funds. And again, in this case, the city's former budget director was named individually, and the SEC alleged that he had arranged these transfers. So again, as Jim had mentioned, if you have a current TC and desist or just be aware that that doesn't mean that the SEC won't come back with a with a, a second enforcement action. And so 
The Wet Community Schools action in July of 2013 is the second case that's notable um, in SEC enforced related to secondary market disclosure. Uh, facts of this case are very simple. West Clark had represented um, an offering document that it was compliant with its prior continuing disclosure obligations when in fact it wasn't. And the SEC not only brought an action against the issuer, also the underwriter, in saying that it had failed in its due diligence obligations to discuss the prior non-compliance by, by West Clark. And, um, you know, past, there had always been this open question of whether or not such a representation by a, an issuer would be considered a material mis representation, and so the SEC really answered this question in 2013 with a yes. And then really another open question about whether or not the SEC is willing to levy a fine against a municipal issuer was also answered with a yes. The SEC assessed its first financial penalty in November of 2013 against when she um, related to the uh, construction of an ice hockey arena. Um, so now we've sort of given you a general overview of some of the highlights in enforcement of 2013, and Brad is going to describe now, you know, based on this and the changes in policy by the SEC, what we can expect going forward. I've actually seen where the SEC has been, the kind of the, the message that they're trying to send to the market. I think it's helpful to try to figure out where the SEC is headed as well. And in order to get a sense as to where the SEC is headed, I think it's important to get the uh, statements uh, that they've made in the past little while. Um, this uh, uh, statement that you see came from SEC chairman, uh, or chairperson, chairwoman, I guess, Mary Jo White. She said, we are going to create, uh, going, we're, we are going to, in certain cases, be seeking admissions. Public accountability can be quite important, and if you don't get them, you litigate them. What cases are those? To some degrees, it turns on how much harm has been done to investors and how egregious the fraud is. So if you apply that statement to past enforcement actions, you would see that uh, there wasn't a lot of harm that was done to the public, but in certain circumstances, it turned upon how egregious the fraud was. So uh, essentially, what you say is that, well, they're going after really cases where there are some really favorable facts and uh, in, in favor of the SEC, or in other words, bad facts against the issuer. Uh, take a look at what admissions are demanded, what, what they're going to do. They're going to see whether investors have been harmed or the context is otherwise egregious. You have to ask whether or not the conduct posed significant risk to the market or investors. Would admissions aid investors deciding whether to deal with a particular party in the future and also reciting the unambiguous facts would send an important message to the market about a particular case. And that's uh, one of the things that the SEC seems to be doing is they seem to be sending messages to the marketplace. And uh, through these enforcement actions, they're trying to correct behavior that, uh, that uh, is otherwise, that they, they perceive as otherwise going on. The thing that is very interesting is that uh, the perspective of individuals, um, this is kind of a change of of um, um, past SEC behavior, uh, they have in the past actually have gone after some individuals. Uh, for example, in the city of San Diego case, they went after some individuals there, and then also in uh, the city of Wenatchee, or the Wenatchee uh, case as well that the Tesh has talked about, they actually went after some individuals there. Chair Chairwoman White said, individuals attempt to commit wrongdoing must understand they risk it all if they do not play by the rules. When people fear their own reputations, careers, or pocketbooks, they have to stay in line. So that's actually one of the areas that where we see um, uh, in the future, there will be actions against high-ranking public officials who sign certifications or authoring documents containing inadequate disclosures. And here, the SEC charged the former city manager for signing the closing letter for one of the bond offerings, falsely certifying that it was accurate and did not contain any misleading statements. Former auditor and controller, bringing letters falsely or representing the city's audited financial statements included in the securities offerings were accurate. The complaint alleged that the officials were reckless and failed to ensure that the representations were true. We will see more fractions under Section 10b-5 
in Rule 10b-5, under 10b and 10b-5, rather than negligence under Section 17a. We'll believe that we'll see actions based upon states made publicly as opposed to in the required securities disclosure documents, for example, the Harrisburg case. Historically, these disclosures were governed by continuing disclosure agreements and not SEC requirements. The SEC has demonstrated its willingness to bring actions based upon these disclosures, even in the absence of rules, statutes, or contracts governing the contents of the disclosures, or default on the part of the issuer, or complaints from investors. We will see actions against municipal issuers for falsely claiming in a bond offering official statement they are fully compliant with the annual disclosure obligations that agreed to in the prior prior offering. For example, the West Clark case. We will see actions against underwriters for failing to conduct conduct adequate due diligence. Also, the West Clark case. Um, the SEC has enhanced its ability to undertake accounting investigations, and in some instances, is able to perform more sophisticated accounting than municipalities. And what it is now is what can be done to help to avoid some of these uh, problems that there are some uh, some enforcement actions or any kind of actions by the SEC investors for that matter. The report investigation here reminds municipal officials of their obligations. Besides 1994 interpretive guidance, municipal issuers should establish practices and procedures to identify and time disclose in a manner designed to inform the trading market material information reflecting on the creditworthiness of the issuer. They all lied to the 1996 report of investigation in the, manner of, in, in the matter of the County of Orange, California. The statements of the public officials who may be viewed as having knowledge regarding the financial conditions operations of the municipal issuer should be carefully evaluated to assure that they are not materially false or misleading. Also, we want, we want to take a look at the Commission's July 2012 Municipal Market Report, which recommends that issuers and other municipal market participants follow and further develop industry initiatives to enhance disclosures for both initial offering documents as well as continuing disclosures. The Herrick report further says that the municipality can take what, what the municipality can do to reduce the risk of investor confusion. At a, min, at a minimum, a municipality should adopt policies and procedures that are reasonably designed to result in accurate, timely, and complete public disclosures. To identify the persons involved in the disclosure process, hire external personnel and external experts for the disclosure function, and designate an individual individual responsible for ensuring compliance with such policies, procedures, and internal controls. It should be here that the adoption of policies and procedures in and of itself will not save you from an investigation. Uh, the security, uh, excuse me, the Internal Revenue Service uh, uh, also uh, encouraged the issuers to adopt policies and procedures, but then a couple of years after the encouragement of policies and procedures, the IRS came out and uh, made mention that they were concerned that issuers were not follow, following their own policies and procedures that they adopted. So their investigations on the Internal Revenue Service side were going to focus upon uh, compliance with the issuer's policies and procedures. And what we've seen over the course of time is that the SEC tends to follow what the, what the IRS has done. And so in addition, in addition to adopting the policies and procedures, there should be measures in place to make sure the policies and procedures are, are followed, and there will want to be, uh, you will have documentation put in place that evidence compliance with those policies and procedures. The other thing to do is evaluate other public disclosures by the issuer, including financial information and other statements, prior public dissemination, and ensure the person responsible, ensure that the responsible individuals receive adequate training about their obligations under federal securities laws. Implement ongoing training regarding compliance and the disclosure obligations. After West Clark, underwriters should take note to obtain copies of prior continuing disclosure agreements and evaluate an issue of compliance with such agreements as part of their due diligence process. If the writer discovers the history of non-compliance by the issuer, the underwriter should request the issuer request the issuer to compliance and implement controls to ensure further compliance. 
one of the interesting things here is an underwriter, as we all know, uh, can't underwrite a bond if it does not have a reasonable basis to assure compliance with past undertakings. If an issue has not been in compliance with past undertakings, that asks the question, that begs the question, how do you assure that an issuer who has been delinquent in the past will comply in the future? Um, we have a couple of different recommendations, uh, essentially making sure that they put their policies and procedures in place, making sure that, sure that they're following those policies and procedures, and correcting any, um, any uh, prior uh, um, failures to properly disclose um, events or any reports that should be filed. So just getting back to what was talked about at the very first of uh, the, 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 the webinar and the takeaways from this, uh, Jim went over them. We like to tell people what we're going to tell them, and then we tell them what we tell them, and then we like to remind them of what we told them. So number one, remember what certificates you're signing. Like officials should review disclosure or set up delegations of responsibility. An underlying tax violation is likely a security law violation. Four, recidivist bad behavior will be punished. Five, declining credits need to pay particular attention to disclosure. The pension fund obligate pension fund disclosure needs a thorough review, not just on whether disclosure tracks state law requirements of funding. Seven, public pension fund advisors are being more carefully monitored by the SEC. Number eight, be aware of deals premised on some kind of valuation. Nine, both policies and procedures and training of your officials and employees. And as a note to that, make sure that you're following your policies and procedures. And the SEC isn't looking to regulate political speech, but it can provide the basis for a fraud instance of proper disclosure compliance. Number one, personal liability by officials is likely to become more common. Number 12, due diligence by underwriters should be thorough. Include respect to continuing disclosures. Thirteen underwriters should ensure that they have reasonably determined an issue of risk for continuing disclosure. There are a variety of different uh, uh, resources that you can use. Um, they are the SEC's website and the MSRB's website as well. Uh, we encourage all participants to visit those websites and become familiar with them because they can provide helpful information. I think that wraps up the webinar. Webinar, we're finished a little bit early, uh, so thank you very much for your participation today. All right, Brad. Um, again, it, it, we went through an awful lot of information uh, in this webinar. Uh, if you would like any additional information, we have articles about uh, that anticipate the 2014 enforcement trends that summarize 2013 and actions, and that also discuss a number of proposed and uh, issued regulations, we'd be happy to send any of those to you. Uh, and uh, on behalf of everyone who, pre um, who presented today, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to joining you again soon.